Welcome, everyone. I am thrilled to be welcoming Tracy Borman, who is with us online on where we can see her. I'm just thrilled to be in her home with her and welcome her and thank her for joining us. Tracy, thank you so much for being oh, with me today. Caroline, it's such a pleasure, particularly as I'm not only able to look at you as I'm talking, but also <laughs> all of my books behind you. So thank you for that. That's yes, very the nice Tracy, to see. My, my Tracy Borman collection is on full display. There are also some on my Kindle that I can't display, but um, you know, I'm a big fan. I'm just, just shy of being um, an Uber. Well, I think I am an Uber fan. So I'll just go ahead and explain <laughs> that. <laughs> so thank you, but, but I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and I want to just jump in. I was lucky enough to get to see Tracy this, um, just this past month in October, mm. but I was also lucky enough. I, I was lucky enough to get to England twice this past year. So first I was in London in February to see the Elizabeth I and Mary Queen of Scots exhibition at the British Library. And at that point, it was all about the Jubilee and getting ready for the Jubilee and so exciting and talking mm. about Queen Elizabeth. And, and then when I went back in October, it was just about a month since she had passed and it was visceral, the difference, mm. the sadness I could feel. So I wondered if we could just talk a little bit about the significance of this one year mm. in the history of the queen and the significance for the country and this milestone mark of 70 years on the throne and then the passing of someone that most of us she's been the queen our whole lives absolutely and what a year you you're so right um and 2022 we always knew was going to be significant in the history of the crown because of the platinum jubilee um and that's the reason i wrote my book crown and mm -hmm. scepter because a few years earlier i thought okay this is coming up great moment to look back over the past thousand or so years of royal history set elizabeth ii's reign in some kind of context um and yeah that's what we're all going to be talking about all year platinum jubilee and then as you say it was completely overshadowed by what happened on the 8th of september with with the passing of the Queen and all that followed in its wake. And so now, 2022, I think we might reference the Platinum Jubilee in future, but it's more about the death of our longest reigning monarch. And that's why this year is just so significant. It's a real watershed moment, I think. And even though, you know, that the House of Windsor, it's got a, a long succession of heirs. That's not something we've seen necessarily all the time in royal history. Of course, Henry VIII's famous quest for a male heir. We have many heirs uh, in waiting for the throne, uh, but it still feels like the end of an era, I think, with the passing of Elizabeth II. And you're right. I think you could feel that in London. Yeah. Um, I went up to London the day after um, the, the Queen's passing. And then it was sort of before the crowds had really started to descend. But the atmosphere, as people just, I walked past Buckingham Palace and the atmosphere, it was just extraordinary. It was very quiet, very, very quiet. And, and people would just seem shell-shocked. And I think mm -hmm. we're still in a bit of a state of shock. It still feels strange to say king, you know, the yes. king's speech and God save the king and all the rest of it. Uh, it's still, we're, we're getting used to it. Well, and I know, you know, just getting into a taxi when I got there in October, immediately, that's what he was talking about, you know, where he was and how he felt and how much he admired the queen. And so it was just automatic. That's what people mm. were talking about. And I will say when I went to the tower and saw what I just knew as the queen's house and all the years of yes. visiting the tower, it was the queen's house. And now it says the king's house. And I just, I was a bit taken aback. <laughs> just... I know. And that was one of the first things to change. You know, it's going to take a bit longer to change all the Yemen warders uniforms, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. But but the king's house now, and you're right, that was kind of jarring. I knew it would happen because uh, actually it was quite helpful in that um, we're, we're always battling against the myth that it was called the queen's house because it was built for Anne Boleyn and that's right. where she was imprisoned. And both of those things are incorrect. So it's, it's named after the reigning sovereign, whether so if it's a king the king's house and which it now is uh, so at least we were able to put to bed the Anne Boleyn myth <laughs> right right but it was jarring to see that 
um, in just out there. So, well, I, I think that's just so interesting and sort of speaks to the significance of her as a person who, you know, you think coming right out of World War II, you know, she comes to the throne quite soon after that and sort of the midst of the rebuilding after that and just the length and the changes in the world mm. over her reign are tremendous. Absolutely. It's it's hard to come get to grips with them, really. Um, such change in those 70 years. This, you know, the, the, the internet had never even been thought of when she came to the throne <laughs> and now it rules everything um, until we're on to the next thing. And, you know, she saw... 15 prime ministers right uh, you know which is record breaking she just broke the record two days before her death wow so much change she met the men who were the first to to land on the moon uh, and all the way through there have been these these sort of landmark events kind of picked out throughout the long long reign of elizabeth ii i don't think we've ever seen well we've never seen such a long reign but we've never seen a reign with quite so much transformation, I think, at all levels of society across the globe, not right. just in Britain. Yeah. Well, and we see so much more of it now with technology. We're so much aware of other countries and, uh, you know, what's happening across the world and her death being marked across the world. We were all able to sort of watch that unfold together. It was a shared moment, which was yeah, um, very um, moving. I, I was just- yeah. I know your, your taxi driver was right. It's one of those things that you remember where you were when mm -hmm. you heard the news. One mm -hmm. of those moments like the, you know, the JFK or the death of Diana or whatever it might be. You can't, you just remember. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That was, that was very interesting. All right. And you mentioned your book, which you can see. Um, <laughs> Two editions after. there. Fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> the hardback and the paperback. Um, yeah. Fortunately, and I'm so lucky, they're signed by you. So um, <laughs> can you put her reign into context as you think of the overall history of the monarchy? You, you mentioned that inspired you, you know, the mm. 70th year inspired you to take on this gigantic project. Um, how does she fit into the history of the monarchy? So um, it was so fascinating to compare her to her 41 predecessors. So I'm taking 1066 as my starting point. Of course, there are kings of England before that, but it's the Anglo-Saxon period. It's a sort of contested kingdom, really, and it's quite often a divided kingdom. And frankly, I didn't want to spend the next however many years trying to pronounce the names of the Anglo-Saxon kings. So, so I'm going to start with William the Conqueror. William, that's yeah. easy. Um, but I think how Elizabeth II's reign will be defined and how it stands out from her predecessors is a sense of constancy and duty. Now, it wasn't without controversy, her long reign, but that controversy tended to involve members of her family, not the queen herself. She was like the steady hand at the wheel, never changing. You know, she, she was very private. The irony was, uh, when researching my book, in that it was actually quite hard to get to her own opinions in a way that it was much easier for the first Elizabeth 500 years earlier. So <laughs> even in this age of mass communication where we know everything that happens as it happens, we don't know so much about Elizabeth II as a person and what she really thought. Um, so that was quite a challenge. Um, but yeah, I think it will, I mean, we've heard those words so much, duty, constancy, mm -hmm. but they really do define her reign. And as I think more than any other reign before her. That's that's wonderful. And that's really nice to think about. And you mentioned Elizabeth I. So of course I remember, not that I heard it, but I have heard it played um, when Winston Churchill talked about the nation and its queens and how the nation has done quite well under its queens. And so I, I think about um, Elizabeth II in this line of queens. So how do you put her in that kind of context? In, in addition to the whole monarchy, but in particular, if we look back to Mary I and Elizabeth I, the first two crowned regnant queens, mm. how is that context set up? How do they set up sort of the history of the queens culminating in Elizabeth II? Well, I think Elizabeth II had an awful lot to be grateful to her predecessors, uh, her previous queen regnants for, because 
they did the hard work in a way. Mm. They had a whole load of prejudice to overcome in convincing people that women could rule in their own right. Uh, this was, you know, until uh, Elizabeth II changed the law of succession, this was an age of, of primogeniture when the crown always passed to the eldest male heir. And mm -hmm. so you would only have a queen if it was a last resort, if there was nobody else. Um, and Mary I, she gets a bit of a bad press. She's bloody Mary. She doesn't reign for very long, but she did have actually quite a lot of groundwork to do in you know, establishing the legal side of being a queen regnant. Mm -hmm. Yes, there have been other queen regnants before her, but not many. Uh, Lady Jane Grey, the nine days queen, we can't really say too much about how she changed the monarchy, of course, because of her brevity. Empress Matilda in the 1100s, contested queen, she wasn't even crowned. So really, we're looking at Mary I onwards for a queen regnant. She So she did a lot to sort of change the 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 way that the legal framework um operated to accommodate a queen and so elizabeth my own favorite elizabeth the first she benefited from that and she mm -hmm. absolutely did but i think what elizabeth did for future queens regnant is that she changed people's minds she mm -hmm. actually managed to overcome that prejudice to convince people that queens could actually be a good thing and so it was nowhere near as difficult um, when Mary came to the throne um, in 1688. Admittedly, she was ruling jointly with her husband, William. But then Queen Anne, again, mm -hmm. very, very popular, even more so Queen Victoria. So but at the beginning of Elizabeth's reign, you have John Knox declaring it's monstrous for a woman to bear rule. By the end of it, England has fallen in love with queens. And so Elizabeth II absolutely benefited from that. Right. And and as you say, it was in Elizabeth II's reign, fairly late in her reign, that the succession law changed once again, I believe right before the birth of Prince George. So whichever way that, you know, had gone. Yeah. Um, and and so Princess Charlotte, I, I like to remind people, is the first princess who, when a younger brother came along, she held her place. Yes. And was not bumped down as Princess Anne had been when her yeah. two younger brothers came along. Yeah, yeah. And I love that fact, actually. I love mm -hmm. that fact. And, and I think personally think Charlotte's a force to be reckoned with. Yes. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but I also like to just muse on what would have happened if this law had come into place sooner? Mm -hmm. um, how many lost queens do we have? You know, the, the first born child if that had been the law then elizabeth of york consort of henry the seventh she would have been queen in her own right and wow. i think she'd have been a great queen too mm -hmm. and there's there are many other examples eldest daughter eldest child of queen victoria, victoria right yeah again um she arguably was a a more capable person than right. her younger brother naughty edward the seventh mm -hmm. um so and and so the list goes on yeah, and that's an interesting way to think about it. So fortunately, going forward, although we have an awful lot of boys right now, but but going forward, um, it will be the eldest. And so we won't see that. Uh, I just love to think of Charlotte holding her place. And as you say, she seems pretty feisty. So I think yeah. she would have held <laughs> onto her place pretty strongly. I think so. All right. So one of the things um, that we see with the passing of the queen is of course a new monarch the king's house god save the king all of these changes and now we're looking forward to a coronation so why in a time of constitutional monarchy you know we certainly understand in the time of mary the first and elizabeth the first when the monarchs ruled and there was so much power involved the coronation was a very important step a very important public step and it happened very quickly after the accession and for good reason. But now, why is the coronation still such an important step or an important event when the monarch doesn't have that kind of uh, governmental legal power? I mean, I know there's still powers invested and all that, but it's a different situation. Why is the coronation still so important? Well, it's part of the fabric of monarchy. And we could ask the same of of other ceremonies, other ancient ceremonies, you know, trooping the colour, uh, state opening of parliament, although that's more constitutional. But there are certain ceremonies 
that are integral to the operation of monarchy. So you're absolutely right. It shouldn't matter. It shouldn't be necessary. It's not constitutionally required as such, but it is so essential in other ways. The whole apparatus of monarchy rests on ceremonies like this, and you don't get a more important ceremony than that of the coronation. And it's symbolic too. And it is absolutely essential to the monarch's role as head of the church, because it's in the coronation that they are anointed. They become God's anointed. In other words, his representative here on earth. Now, in former days, it was believed that that was a sort of almost magical moment, that moment of anointing. It's the most sacred part of the service. It's never been filmed, by the way. We've never seen that because even for Elizabeth II's coronation, which was the first to be televised, the cameras had to be turned off for the anointing because it was seen as just so special. So it'll be interesting to see what happens uh, on May the 6th. But um, but so it, it is of crucial importance to the monarch's religious role, even if, you know, politically it isn't perhaps so required. All right. And so the anointing and I um, I believe that the anointing spoon is the only piece of the regalia that survived Oliver Cromwell intact. And so that is actually an 11th or 12th century item. That's right. It's one of the, well, it, you're right. It's, it's the, the most intact survivor. There's also the Black Prince's ruby, mm -hmm. um, which has made it into the crown or one of the crowns. But as, as a sort of intact item, yes, that ancient coronation spoon, it escaped the flames. And that's that's fascinating. And when I was at the tower, the regalia was there. So I was able to see and look and see the ruby. And um, they say that Elizabeth's earrings, I'm pointing to mine like that, is any kind of connection. So I'll just <laughs> that. Um, Elizabeth's the first pearl earrings yes. are perhaps, you know, included in the imperial state crown. Exactly. Um, so the anointing is is a religious part. The actual placing of the crown and it's St. Edward's crown that the monarch is crowned with. Mm -hmm, and then that's right. Where the monarch wears the imperial state crown. Mm -hmm. I remember there was a program a few years ago with Queen Elizabeth where she was talking about the crown and it was in front of her and she was moving it around and showing and it was just incredibly fascinating to watch mm. her talk about her she's she mentioned that her father's head and her head were roughly the same size so it fit fine or something yeah, that was really That's, funny. The details like that are so interesting aren't they and the fact that you know we know she she practiced uh with it because you know that and the and the St Edward's crown you know very heavy things you know, mm -hmm. sort of you know solid gold or silver all those jewels right. not easy to keep on your head even right. for a short time. So yeah, fascinating. I and love those human details. That you'd have, she'd have ever worn before. So you can understand why she'd want to, to practice and, and have yeah. that. Absolutely. And I, I remember one of the moments that I found the most moving when watching the funeral is when the crown and scepter and orb were returned to the altar. Yes. Wasn't that symbolic? That was such a moment mm -hmm. and I think there were so many subtle and perhaps more obvious um, messages conveyed about the continuity of monarchy mm -hmm. so um, I think it's my, one of my favorite quotes in the whole history of the monarchy was by Lord Lyndhurst who was high chancellor to three different monarchs during mm -hmm. uh, the 19th century and he said the sovereign always exists the person only is changed. So this idea, you have this continuity, there's always the sovereign, uh, people come and go on the throne, but there's this essential continuity. And moments like that, when the crown and scepter were moved onto the altar, that sort of symbolized, okay, that one individual monarch has passed, but the crown still exists, the sovereign still exists. And it's this relentless progress onto the next. Oh, that's wonderful to think of that quote in the context of that. That was the first time I've seen that. I think the committal service it's mm, called. Yeah. 
And that was the first time I'd seen that. And I just found that tremendously um, moving. And and, and wasn't it like that? I couldn't take my eyes off a moment of that day um, because this was the first time that most people in this world had ever seen this. Right. So, you know, the 70 years, um, people can't remember, most people can't remember a time when when Elizabeth II hadn't been reigning over us. So it was like all of these things that I've been writing about, you know, some of them I was seeing for the very first time because they'd never been televised. Right. Um, and, and you actually were there witnessing it all. And it felt like just watching history in the making. Yes, I was very aware of that, that this is history. We're we're practically participating in it. You know, we're watching it right in front of us. And so, well, on the television. But that that was that was really wonderful. And she seems to embody that idea that it wasn't about her as a person. She was just filling her role yes. in this ongoing sovereignty. Um definitely that seems to really embody her. Yes. Yes, and she, and I think she she inherited that sense of duty, or she learned it from her father, George the Sixth, who never right. wanted to be king. If right. Edward the Eighth hadn't abdicated, you know, he he wouldn't have been king. He was probably the most reluctant monarch in history. He said that he woke on his uh, awoke on his coronation day with a sinking feeling. You know, he didn't, but he was governed by duty, and gosh, he did pass that on to his daughter Elizabeth the Second. Well, that's that's a really interesting way to think, too, because so often we see these men and women, but mostly men who really do want to be king and are willing to fight and battle and, you know, do all kinds of things. And that doesn't necessarily mean they're the best or most <laughs> prepared or most appropriate, whereas George the Sixth seemed to be exactly who the country needed at yes. that time, reluctant though he may have been. Yes, it exactly. The right person at the right yeah. time. And I'm so pleased you said that because one of the themes that I found most fascinating when writing Crown and Scepter was that often the most successful monarchs were those who never were destined to come to the throne. Mm. So I look okay. at Elizabeth I, obvious example. Right. She was just the youngest daughter. She wasn't even the youngest child, the youngest daughter. <laughs> So there was another daughter in front of her and a son in front of her. And you know, George VI, not supposed to be king. Uh, Elizabeth II, therefore, not right. supposed to be queen. Right. They all did a really good job of it. Right. It, it is really interesting. Um, yeah, they, they mm. aren't necessarily the automatic, but yes. they, they do end up rising to the occasion. And yeah. And and really being, and, and I know um, from what I've read that George VI was quite determined that his daughter Elizabeth be prepared in a way he had not. And so yes. he involved her as much as he could and really yeah. prepared her. Yeah, absolutely. And I think though, even, even though George VI hadn't expected to be king, he sort of went into it with his eyes wide open. And I think that's why there was a reluctance because he knew it's not just all the glittering crowns and the right. sprawling palaces it's it's a really tough job and that's a very simplistic way of putting it but it is a tough job and i think he he wanted his daughter and successor to go in with her eyes even more open than his his had right. been right and and um queen elizabeth the queen mother um also i i had read was hesitant to marry when he was just the Duke of York, because she didn't yes. really want to be Duchess of York. <laughs> yes, even that, even that. Um, even that so good. yeah, absolutely, that's that's so right. But they'd managed to live this blissful, fairly private existence right. until, of course, everything changed thanks to Edward and Wallace and, and the abdication. Right. But still, they were such a strong family and you do yeah. get that sense that they were so tight knit. Uh, you refer to yes. them four all the time. We yeah. four. Yeah. I love that. And, and yeah. they had a sort of private home on Piccadilly in London, which admittedly is a very nice address, but it's not <laughs> it's not a palace. It's not a palace. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, well, it is it is wonderful to think of that. And now I'd like to. Um, think back just a bit and I'm just hoping that this I hear some noise outside so I'm going to lean in a little bit and hopefully yeah. that'll be all right um you have been involved with a program about an earlier monarch and so you know if we think of someone who wasn't supposed to be king 
Henry VIII, but I think went all in when he became <laughs> king. So tell us about, there's a recent Netflix series. If any of you have not seen it, you must check it out. Um, and one of the things I was struck by, okay, you have the history and you have today, and they've done things that just eliminate that gap. So when we see Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, there's modern music playing, yeah. there's a modern flair, and Anne will turn to the camera and make a very modern sounding comment <laughs> in the context of they're at Hever Castle and they're filming at Hever Castle. And you are on, and Dr. Owen Emerson and Professor Susanna Lipscomb, these wonderful historians, and that's not all, that's just a handful, there are yeah. others, wonderful historians. So there's the history and there's the modern, but they are brought together. So can you tell us about that? I just found that yeah. fascinating. Oh, I'm so pleased because uh, it's a project I've worked on for some time. So I was, as well as being one of the contributors on screen, I was the historical advisor for that, for blood, sex and royalty. And I hope, and I think it does give a fresh perspective. And that's qu quite hard to do on one of the most told stories in <laughs> yes, Tudor history, yes. the, uh, yeah. the story of Anne Boleyn. But the producers were very clear from the start. They wanted to bring Anne's story to a whole new generation. And of course, to do that, they had to make it a bit more relevant, a bit more contemporary. So you're absolutely right. The dialogue is very modern. Mm -hmm. um, and that I can't pretend was easy as historical advisor. I kept saying, yeah, but she wouldn't have said that. You know? <laughs> so I had to get over myself with that and just stick with advising on the facts, the historical facts. And likewise, the music. But I think it, it it does make it suddenly seem fresh. And I think, in my opinion, it's the best cast I've ever seen for any Anne Boleyn, Henry mm -hmm. drama. I think Anne herself is exceptional. Um, I think Henry VIII, not only is he sexy, mm -hmm. but which he was, and we forget he that. was, yeah. He was. But you can believe he would kill you the next moment. Uh, he's right. got this real <laughs> sort of brutal look in his eyes. My favourite standout character, though, is George Boleyn. And his relationship with Anne feels so genuine. And they were obviously very close, brother and sister. Um, and apparently when the actors filmed their final scene together, they were both in tears because they'd both grown so close oh. over the course of filming. So okay. I think that really comes across on mm -hmm. screen. And and that was so was the last thing they filmed the jousting scene because I I don't know if they filmed it in order okay. I just know that when it came to their last scene it was they were both gutted because they'd absolutely loved spending time together and they kind of hung out in between filming and that so yeah well, that was can, lovely and I certainly felt in that jousting scene that they were both on the point of tears I mean that, yes you know and historically that they would have thought mm, this is something's going yeah. on here that's not good yeah but, but they did just seem so connected yes um as we know the real right. Anne and George were um mm -hmm. you know but not ever in any incestuous right. way that right. was just a very cynical way of of you know putting another nail in Anne's coffin I think right yes to disgust everyone and, and yes yeah, yeah just throw incest in there make yeah. it even yeah. more shocking make you it know even more awful yeah um, I also really believed that she loved Henry which doesn't always come through in portrayals mm. that Anne was in love he was yeah. certainly in love and obsessed and everything, but she really seemed to care a lot about him in this yeah. portrayal, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah, I think, and, and that's one of the most debated issues, isn't it? Did <laughs> Anne really love Henry? Because we've got all of his love letters. We don't have any of her replies. And that's so frustrating as historians. Yeah. Um, but I do believe this was, he, he was an incredibly attractive, charismatic, right. magnetic personality. And that tends to be overshadowed by the sort of bloated tyrant that Holbein gives yes. us. Yes. Um, yes. But he was something else. He was described as an Adonis when he first came to the throne. And I think Anne was drawn to him, um, mm. whether it was just a strong attraction or whether she genuinely loved him. Um, I think there was something more there for Anne than just wanting to be queen, I think. Right. Yes. No, I, th I, th I think that is right. And I really liked their relationship. But as you say, part of it and we know the outcome but part of it is sometimes when he'd look at her and you think uh-oh <laughs> yes know, yes <laughs> in his eye that 
yeah, that's not going to end well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that, but it was very, very well done. So I, I do appreciate you sharing that um, because it looks like it was loads of fun. Oh, yes. Do. Yes, it was. I, I mean, I never tire of talking about Anne Boleyn, but, <laughs> but, that, but seeing her through different eyes really was very interesting for me. And, and it challenged me, you know, it challenged my instincts as a historian at times, but I just kept focused on, well, as long as if, you know, that the history behind this is correct. Uh, and then it just totally won me over because I thought, why shouldn't we tell it in a more contemporary way? Uh, and and right. I think Anne's story deserves to be more wide, widely known or a, among, you know, different generations. I could imagine, you know, teenagers watching right. this and getting something out of it, which I think is great. Right. right. Which And it reminds me of Six, the musical. Yes. Oh. This fresh. Yes. Fun. History is fun kind of look, which. Exactly. You know, and real people. These were real people. Yes. Even the relationship with Anne and Lady W, you know, when oh, she yes. loses that friendship and you, you know, that happens and, uh, you know, it just made sense in the context yeah. that we saw it because we saw them be friends and then we saw them not be friends. And that just exactly. makes a lot of sense. Yes, absolutely. And it, and it was so relatable mm -hmm. to, to have a really close friend like that and you kind of do everything together and then be you know stabbed in the back by them and and how that makes you feel and yeah. and I just the way they focused in on relationships that we we've all had we've we can right. all relate to yes. you know these aren't people just 500 years ago who did things completely differently you know they're people with feelings that we can relate to today right right and that's when I said it it shrinks the time between their lives and our life because they're not that different and that's what I yeah. really felt from that definitely um, that really contemporary very relatable right here right now feel so oh, oh that's so good to good. hear about because it was really fun so again i'll put all these in the show notes but it's on netflix and it's just great fun i was so excited when I, you know we're counting down a bunch of us counting down today, so it was really fun. oh i'm so and i'm so pleased as well that immediately it was available everywhere because often yes. when i do shows they're yes. in the uk uh, but then i get a lot of you know comments on social media yeah but when's it coming to the us and right. it's like i don't know but with right. this Yes, immediately it goes global, and that was fantastic. Yes, so. I, I checked that on Netflix right away, and I was very glad to see it was coming on. <laughs> so, so that is good. So that's good for us. And and um, so speaking of Anne Boleyn, you have another project that we've all been waiting to hear more about. So, um, tell us. Oh, Caroline, I'm so happy about this next book because I get got to write about my two favorite women. So Anne Boleyn and Elizabeth the first. I am looking in this book, non-fiction book, at the relationship between mother and daughter. The mother and daughter who changed history is the subtitle and it aims to really put Anne front and centre of Elizabeth's life where she hasn't been really before. I hear it repeated so often, Elizabeth thought nothing of her mother, she only mentioned her twice, that in itself is inaccurate, um, and that it was all about her father. But of course, Elizabeth gave that impression. She was always talking about Henry VIII. That's because she was a very good politician and yeah. she had to remind people she was a Tudor because at least half of her subjects thought she had no right to the throne. She was illegitimate. She was the daughter of the scandal of Christendom. But actually what this book sets out to prove is that Elizabeth basically spent her life trying to rehabilitate her mother's reputation. And that was huge um and and she did it so subtly she did it in actions not words she knew she would be literally digging up the past if she made mm -hmm. a song and dance about being Anne Boleyn's daughter but look at who she surrounds herself with as queen all Boleyns her court is filled with her Boleyn relatives they are her closest attendants and I unearthed some fascinating finds in things like inventories, uh, which show the sort of possessions that, Anne's, that that Elizabeth surrounded herself with, so many of which she inherited from her mother. And she was completely her mother's daughter. They had so many character traits in common. I think she resembled her mother. Mm -hmm. Now, admittedly, the portraits we have of Anne Boleyn may probably only date from after her death, and, and many of them from Elizabeth's reign. 
but you see that same kind of slim face and the mm-hmm. dark eyes. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you think this, I, I would say she was a chip off the old block, but that's probably too much of a pun for the Tudor, <laughs> the Tudor age. But I think she, she really did revere her mother. And so it's not just, or it's not only uh, a, a, a joint biography. Um, what this book does is look specifically and quite forensically at the relationship between Anne and Elizabeth and the impact it had both on Elizabeth, but also England, the history of England. These were two women who changed England forever. uh, And we're still feeling the effects. There is still somebody in line to the throne who has Berlin blood flowing through his veins and that's Prince William. Um, Mm -hmm. so, So the Prince of Wales is a direct descendant of Mary Boleyn. So I just love the fact that Boleyns are not quite done with the monarchy yet. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. No. And that's that's so wonderful because we do see the very public statements Elizabeth made about her father to as a politician, you're right. And and yeah. for her political survival and success. But I love the little details. I love the checkers ring. And yes, we've talked about that. I love the linens you can see in the V&A Museum where you can see the falcon that's embroidered into and the falcon yes. is on the her um, her musical instruments. Yes. And, uh, you know, I know right up until her death when there are falcons all over the tomb at yes. Westminster Abbey. So, yeah, yeah, it's just tremendous. Um, yeah. Yeah, and she and she, she becomes less subtle about it as her reign goes on, and she becomes more confident as a queen. So, from the 1570s, she's seen off rivals left, right, and centre. She's starting to establish herself as queen, and that's when she has some fun with it a bit more. She surrounds herself with Anne's falcon, as you say, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. all the way up to her death. Mm-hmm. I think, though, my probably my favorite artifact is still that checkers ring right Uh, it speaks volumes i know there's some debate is it anne inside you know it's a locket ring that opens up portrait of anne portrait of elizabeth i do believe that is a portrait of anne you know facially Mm -hmm. it's identical to the portraits same french hood Mm -hmm. uh and and why would elizabeth have anybody else in a locket ring i kind of think yeah it speaks volumes about what she thought about anne boleyn i think so i've heard somebody said it was elizabeth as a young woman but no but also why would you why would you when elizabeth was now in her 40s want to be reminded of what you right. like when you were younger it's it's depressing I yes, know. Right. no that's why I, I just don't think that makes any sense at all no. <laughs> exactly but, but it was her private way you know connecting with her mother that has always yeah. made the most sense to me and and i was just i got to see it a couple of times and it's just tremendous so that yeah. is a shivers for me that's a shivers down the spine moment absolutely Absolutely. So yes, of course, you'd have seen it at the British Library. And yes, yeah, yes, fabulous. And actually, a few years before it was there was a, the real Tudors exhibition at yes. the Portrait Gallery. And I planned an entire trip around that, too. So that's <laughs> excellent. Excellent. The Tudors basically dictate your, you know, cross Atlantic travel. Yep. I'm, I'm good with that. <laughs> but um, and, and I just can't wait. I can't wait. Oh. To so it will be out on a very important date, May 19th. <laughs> That's right. So it's published in the UK on the 19th of May, obviously the anniversary of Anne Boleyn's execution. And for once in the US, you don't have to wait too much longer than that. It's out in June in the US. Oh, so great. quite often okay. it's like six months after the UK right. release date. Yes. But, um, you know, it's it's not going to be that long. So okay. I'm really pleased. I'm really Good. pleased. Oh, well, we can't, we can't wait in the US and in the UK and I'm sure everywhere else. I'm, I'm sure everywhere else. All right. So now what are you working on? What's ahead? Can you give us any clues? Sure. Anything. Yes. So in fact, um, I've gone back to fiction now. Um, So I am just starting a new novel. And uh, although I can't say what it's about, I can say that given you're a fan of the Tudors like me, it will hopefully be of interest to you. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm at least locating it period wise. Um, And so I'm at that stage now where I have a blank screen in front of me. Uh, I have a blinking cursor and my house is spotless because 
<laughs> I keep thinking, oh, you know what? Instead of writing, uh-huh. I'm just uh-huh. going to go and do some cleaning. I'll take the dog for a walk. I'll do anything mm-hmm. other than write those first painful sentences that it takes until you get into your stride and get going. Um, but no, I will. I promise I will get on with it. Um, and that's going to be out. Oh, so 2024, I think. Uh, so a couple of years. So I've got one out next year and then this will be out the year after that. Okay. Um, so, yes, I have. I, it's all about the fiction for the for the time being, which is oh, hugely fine. exciting because I, I do love writing fiction. Well, that's that's so do you ever find it difficult to do the nonfiction and fiction? Do you sort of keep them separate one project at a time? Yes, kind of I do. Okay. And I think I'm often asked which I prefer. And I honestly can say I like them both equally because what I love about nonfiction is the process. It's it's more predictable. You do the research, you write about it. Um, but there can be frustrating gaps, as I'm sure you know. You you really want to find something and it's just not there. Um, and you have to go with the sources. But with fiction, of course, you can fill those gaps with your imagination. But I do find I need to be much more in the mindset for fiction because you have to, you know, imagine scenes and and create dialogue and it and it takes more I suppose creativity so mm. if I wake up just not in the mood it's more difficult <laughs> than it is with non-fiction where it's it's much more of a process I think but I'm very very lucky to do both I, I, I hope to continue doing both oh that's wonderful well that's great because we certainly as you see read both um, <laughs> thank you <laughs> no I I think that's wonderful okay so we we've got Anne Boleyn coming out and then a fiction coming out the next year. So Anne Boleyn and Elizabeth in 2023. Yes. And then in 2024 fiction. Will That's it be right. a series? So yeah, I'm contracted to write three novels. Ah. Okay. Um, but um, it's not planned as a series. It's planned as three standalone novels. But I have a little cunning plan to make it a sort of series. I have a way of doing it. So okay. to not, not reveal too much, the, the first novel does cover the whole life of a person. So unlike my first fiction trilogy, where it's the same heroine all the way through, Francis, you know, Mm -hmm. this one, you know, that the leading character will have died by the end, but I've still thought of a way of kind of continuing it. So, um, Uh so we'll see, we'll see. Oh, all sorts of things to look forward to. That's great, (laughs) that's great, that's great. All right, and I will put it in the show notes, but just remind us um, where social on social media we can find you. Yes, so I'm on Twitter at Tracy Borman. I'm on Instagram, um, Tracy.Borman, I think. I'm less good at the hashtags or the handles or whatever. Um, and so they're my two main um, kind of social media outlets. And I've got a website, um, tracyborman.co.uk, where I put news about new books on TV shows and uh, and also events that I'm doing. Uh, and right. uh, and I do occasionally come to the States as well. Uh, but obviously, if any of your viewers who are in the US are coming over to England, please come and say hello. Yes. Well, and and I I always do. So <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> we had a great meeting, meet up oh, at the British Library. Which that was, was just fun. <laughs> so fortuitous. I took about timing. You're like, I'm yes. going to be at the British Library on Monday. So am I. So we, <laughs> it was, it was so magical. We met. Yeah, it was. It was. It was. It was so good. So thank you. Well, thank you so much for joining us and sharing just really the history of the monarchy. So we start with you know, William the Conqueror in 1066. We've talked a little bit about Henry and Anne Boleyn, both in their time and how they're portrayed now. And Elizabeth the first, how she fits in all the way up to um, the death of her majesty and um, looking forward to the coronation next year of a king. So we're all saying God save the king and it still feels a little odd to me. Yes, to hear that, <laughs> yeah. but I'm, we've got, we've got to get our heads around that before May. <laughs> yes, because it's still um, it just doesn't quite come naturally yet, but it will. So yeah. thank you, Tracy. As always, it's been just a pure delight to talk to you. Thank you for joining us on video as well, so we get to see you. And so I can show off my little collection. Yes. And so <laughs> eagerly look forward to your book being released and hope you will um, come back and talk about oh, it when it's out. I would I would be delighted. I always love chatting with you, Caroline. So thank you for having me back. Thank you so much. And thank you for listening, everyone. And we'll see you again soon. Mm-hmm.